over the years we've learned that we can cure patients with cancer, but uh, recognize that we may be over-treating patients, doing too much therapy. Uh, in our zeal to cure patients, perhaps we could get away with less treatment if we were to step back. So years ago, uh, we, we came to the belief that in rectal cancer, which is cancer of the large intestine, but the, the end of the large intestine in, in the rectum, we've learned that the optimal way of curing patients involved using radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery all together. And there was debate about in which order they could be done, but we felt we needed to do each of those in, in combination to cure patients. Having over time observed outcomes for patients and after based on some uh, pre uh, preliminary data from other groups, we felt we could perhaps eliminate the need for radiation in a subset of patients. Obviously, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery all have long-term consequences for patients. So uh, we set out to see, could we identify a population of patients with rectal cancer who didn't need radiation? We had some ideas of who those patients might be. And so we designed a trial which randomly tested the question of, could we do without radiation in a subset of patients? But of course, when you develop that kind of study, you need to make sure that you're not putting patients at risk, or at least minimize the risk that you'll take a curable disease and not cure the patients by eliminating one of the modalities. So we designed a study that had some safeguards for, to protect patients who were randomly assigned either to the standard therapy, which included chemo, chemotherapy with radiation and then surgery, uh, or that went just with chemotherapy and then surgery without radiation. We built in some safeguards, uh, conducted the trial over, ma over eight years it took us to complete the trial, and we found the results uh, uh, that uh, demonstrated that, in fact, this subset of patients can do well and be cured without radiation. Every treatment has downstream consequences. Radiation has effects in your, uh, the tissues in the region that are, are radiated to protect against the cancer coming back. Uh, especially women will be affected in terms of their uh, menstruation, their ovaries will be destroyed by radiation, uh, their, uh, their pelvic structures may not function normally. Uh, similarly, men can have difficulty with sexual function. Uh, th those are major issues. Uh, what's more is when you do radiation in, let's say you have a, a, a surgical reconstruction of the rectum, uh, r radiation can, can make that rectum not function as you normal rectum would. So uh, there are downstream consequences of radiation for quality of life. And then, although not all that common, there's a risk of other cancers developing in patients who've had radiation. The cancer, radiation can lead to cancer development in the radiated field. Not common, but that can happen as well. We have bone density issues, all sorts of problems. Uh, but trust me, if you can do without radiation, patients would prefer that. Uh, we certainly, if you can do without surgery, patients would prefer that too. Uh, but you, you, you know, we have to pick and choose uh, which of these things we, we're going to try to eliminate in what studies. The, the take-home message for the moment is that patients who did not get radiation had, in general, a, an improved quality of life w over the for the year after the, the, their surgery and or after their treatment. I think in the long term, it'll be important to follow these patients to see if some of the long-term consequences of radiation, for example, which uh, patients who don't get radiation, they shouldn't have those consequences, and we'll see how that affects quality of life. I think it's fair to say that Every study we do, we look at, at what are called interim results, and right now we're convinced that the, there's no compromise in patients' survival or the risk of recurrent cancer. Over time, though, we'll make sure that that's the case, but similarly we'll see if, if not having had radiation in a subset of patients may change and improve the quality of life of these patients down the road. That, that has obviously great ramifications the young, for younger patients who have many more years to live with the consequences of these therapies. Part of this is educating doctors as well as educating patients. The, um, I think we all of us have to take stock of what our standard treatments are and make sure that we couldn't do with less or make sure our decisions are based not so much on, on the harsh data but on how it affects our individual patients. There are all sorts of nuances we need to bring to bear. Older patients uh, might tolerate less therapy. On the other hand, being old doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't get the standard aggressive treatment. And one of the caveats about this study, for example, that the rectal cancer study we're talking about is, is since the study was initiated, there, the change in the demographics of rectal cancer is really mind-boggling. 
there's a very large skewing towards younger people getting rectal can colorectal cancer compared to how it was 10 or 20 years ago. It remains to be seen if this kind of, of study, which did not have a large number of younger people, if these results will also apply to younger patients with this disease. They may very well, but we have to see that. So, so, so this study is as, as important as it is and as, as much as it can change the standard for some patients, we still have to make sure we understand how it fits into the armamentarium for every patient we see. Not every patient's gonna be suitable for this approach. So, so when you have an advance like this where you have a major presentation and it's published literature now, we, we can agree that, that for a subset of patients this is a new option and a, an appropriate standard of care. How do, we prom how do we get that out to the community? Well, there are what are called guidelines, a variety of services, but the one that's most well known is called the NCCN guidelines. And these are available to lay people, to doctors, and they're used pretty much by insurance companies as well to govern what the standard of care is for given patients with certain disease status and, uh, and, and their uh, treatment algorithm. So, what we'll do here, for example, is these guidelines will be amended in the next few weeks to, rep to recognize that there's a change in, in options for a subset of patients. So, so the, in this guideline, the rectal cancer guideline, we, we will spell out who the patients are who might be uh, eligible for this kind of different approach, and then spell out how to do it, that is, what are the criteria for who's suitable, and then what what interim steps do you have to take to make sure you're not compromising their outcome? So they need imaging, let's say, as the study did. Patients who were not getting radiation as the standard had, had imaging with MRI scan or endoscopy, direct visualization to make sure the cancer was shrinking on chemotherapy. So those factors will be built into the algorithm for how you manage these patients. And, and hopefully that'll be out in the next month or so posted in the next month or so. In the meantime, so patients who fit into this category, some may know about it, some may not. Uh, this gets a fair bit of play because it's been in the New England Journal and at the major meetings. That doesn't mean that every practitioner is aware of it though. You're always happy with any advance, especially what I think is an important and substantial advance here in making lives better for patients and, and not compromising cure. Obviously, for me, there was a certain satisfaction because I had chaired the committee that designed the study and, and had really work, worked to get it approved through the various regulatory bodies to be able to be done. So in many ways, it was, very, it was an affirming experience to see the results were as we thought they would be. But the real great part of it is that uh, we accomplished, we did it right. I think we, did it, we didn't compromise patient safety, and really we did it in a convincing way. Uh, so the most satisfying thing of, of research is actually answering a question definitively, and I think we did that. Now, of course, we can learn a lot more, and I do hope and I expect that the analysis of the tissues, the samples that we have obtained, of the genes, the molecular features of these cancers and other factors, will make it easier for, for all of us to understand who these patients are and what we need to do to cure them not exactly, not sort of using the parameters we did for clinical surf, uh, issues, but perhaps some clues about genes or mutations or features of the cancer that can tell the practitioner this patient needs radiation or this patient doesn't need radiation. The real goal is, uh, is through the new technology, AI for example, to crunch all this information we have on all these patients and perhaps come up with a hierarchy that can tell us we know how to treat this patient based on ABC, less so on the nuanced decision making on a, of oncologists where there may be less or more experience with the disease and less comfort in making the nuanced decisions if we could, cut, if we could put it into black and white with clear parameters that are, are based on uh, objective data, that would be our preference and hopefully we'll get to that point.